Welcome to Potentials, and thank you for viewing today. Thank you for subscribing and liking and commenting. I always appreciate that. And today we have our special guests, Frank Chili and Dr. Andrea Martin. Thank you for returning back to the show. I always look forward to seeing you guys. It's always thank awesome. you. Thank you. Andrea, it's always an honor and joy. Always an honor and joy. Yeah. Thank you, Frank. <laughs> Andrea, you had a, a special message for us today. Would you yes. like to share that? Yes. So um, this week I was contacted by Semhiase. So I guess people who are familiar with the work of Billy Mier, who is actually still living. Um, he met with um, Semhiase many, many years ago, and um, I was able to connect with her a few times. And um, she did want to uh, say something to me this this week. We both were kind of busy, so we were able to kind of connect at one point. Um, I got to meet her in, in the Astral on a ship, which was nice. Um, oh, so cool. uh, we didn't get to do anything too much, but she just like got some great stuff. And she like, just wanted, I want to share this. And um, so what I did, so I guess for some people who aren't familiar, um, so there's kind of like two of me <laughs> and I have a house on the Pleiades on the planet era. So I invited um, Semyase to my house where we could kind of have a little bit of a relaxing uh, moment and, and, and she could you know, share the information she had. Um, so we did do that the other day. And while we're sitting at, um, so that the house is well, my house, um, is this kind of like a fjord. And then there's an, an ocean with like grayish pebbly small stones. And it's beautiful. Like it's a gorgeous, really vast fjord um, with some mountains and snow in the back. And up and like as a meadow area, there is my house. Um, and it looks, it reminds me, I guess, um, there's two descriptions to it, which I think Louise Jones had a good one. She says, it looks kind of like the... Um, house that they have with Luke Skywalker on um, that that planet with all this because it's not sandy or anything like that but that kind of like uh it's it's white um right to me they, they kind of remind me of a combination of that and and the houses in Greece or the Mediterranean that kind of white you know um so we were able to sit in my my kitchen table <laughs> so um she she's cute she's so so I want to explain so when, when people telepath it's 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 pictures, it's movie, it's words, it's sound, it's all kinds of things put together. Um, but she what she wanted to talk about was was 2024 and what's going to be rolling out. And I and I have a few things here I think that, that will will make some sense. And um, some of this I'm not sure you know how much of it she wanted to be revealed or anything, or if it was just a, a kind of something she wanted to kind of just throw out there like this was what some ideas were going to be. But she um she was she was showing me like papers, you know, <laughs> like I've got something to show you. <laughs> so. Um, she says it's going to be like 2024 and and the next years. Um, just everything is 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 pretty well put into place. So the idea of things being kind of confusing, she says that's not the case really. Everything is going to kind of roll out as as planned. Um, I mean there were probably there were, there were a few little changes and everything, but she's basically it's going to go forward. Um, and they they don't they never have in the past uh, couple of years. I've I've been talking with different people. Um, up on the ships and, and here um, nobody's ever had a negative they're all very positive about this I don't have any there's there's no like it's all going to be you know catastrophe terrible things are going to happen I, I don't get anything like that so um, they're always pretty positive about how it's going to roll out so as of course as we all know right there there are people from other planets who are born on other planets um, that are already amongst us and um, so as she says what this they're going to start putting more people into place um, into our society. So it's going to be very strategic, she says, how they're going to start placing these people. She also says, of course, it's going to, it's going to, much of what you're going to start to see kind of get softened by, um, by rolling out some of these new technologies. So people start to get a little more familiar with what is going to happen. And of course, as you know, and, and Louise Jones mentioned this too, and Semyase seconded that, um, that, you know, the ships, people are going to start seeing more and more ships. And of course, the thing with that is you have to look up. So there's not a lot of people that walk around. You can tell us by our bad necks. Bro. Yes. <laughs> there's not a lot of people. You know, I, I had a ship actually follow on the side of my mother's car and, and she didn't even see it, you know. Wow. But you're not looking. You're driving and you're not looking, right? So yeah. uh, this is, I think, part of um, <laughs> the, the complexity is they're going to have to do something a little bit more than just fly by because no one's going to see that. Um, so I don't, I don't know. Anyway, the ships are going to start, um, the craft are going to start being uh, revealed more and more and more. Uh, she says, of course, more more people are going to be placed in the society. Um, and she really says, you know, they, they want the technology out. They want us to start getting familiar with this technology. And I did ask her, I said, you know, do, do you think that um, there's going to be any sort of issues or whatever? And she said, no. And I, and I have to agree with that. I really don't think a catastrophic disclosure will happen. 
I just don't think, so. I think people are absolutely, I, everybody I talk to, and I mentioned that to her, um, and she's like, oh yeah, and, and they know because they have so many people living here. <laughs> so I just don't think um, the majority of people are going to be phased by this, to be honest. I think I think people are over ready at this point. Um, yes. Not just for the, <laughs> yes. they just, you know, and of course, I, as I teach, the, I teach college classes and, and um, all of my students, you know, definitely. So, so here's the deal. I work with uh, people who have absolutely no idea about anything to do with disclosure or UFOs or anything like that. And, um, and I just throw it at them. And to be honest with you, they're, they're just ready. Almost every single person you meet that you just kind of bring this stuff up. Um, it's not, it's not a concern. They're, they're, they're excited. They're, so I think that might be the difference um, from you know what we're going to be talking about today. The fifties, maybe I don't know. It depends on the person. But um, the way it is now, I just I just think people are ready, and yeah. you don't have so much as a golf in technology. Say from the nineteen fifties. You know we have we have CGI now, so people are seeing stuff on films or on TV. They're seeing stuff in social media. Um, right. That's that stuff that never happened years ago. And right. and again, Linda and I, you and I were just briefly talking about this, and I, and I didn't ask some Yassi, I should have, I forgot at the time. <laughs> um, Frank, we had a little conversation with, um, but, you know, it's it's more astral now. And this was something we didn't understand. Like, you know, when we're talking, we're going to go back here to get back to the 50s and, you know, the good old days there, uh, where people had a lot more physical contact. But nowadays, people are not having as much physical contact. Um, right. So this is... You know, and I don't, I'm, I don't know if that's more. Yeah. So, I mean, that, that's actually like, I walked around the ship, like when I was waiting for her, I just waited on the ship, um, on a bench waiting for her to come. She, you know, she was swamped. We were both swamped. Then I had some time after and I just kind of walked around the ship a little bit. Um, but you know what, you know, you, you just fit right in, you know, they don't say, well, who's this? I mean, you just, I mean, I've been on ship, I go on ships quite a bit and it's just, they just, I think at this point, normally know me, but it's like, you, you just, you know, it's not an issue. Um, so I, that's about it, really. Um, she's she's happy. I know we'll be talking again. And um, anybody else who, who who would like to come in and, and share what their their thoughts from you know upstairs or any anybody down here, of course, as well, who wasn't born on this planet, who'd like to share. Uh, we're always open to you know discuss. So um, that's pretty much it. <laughs> the news from upstairs is. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you, Samasi, and thank you, uh, Andrea, for sharing. Thank you. Yes. Hopefully, you can, hopefully you should be able to watch this. I think it'd be. Uh... It's very exciting news, actually. I'm very happy to hear. Well, that. She, yeah. I mean, she's super nice, super nice. As we said, she's down to earth. <laughs> yeah. But she is literally she's really. Yeah. Nice. I look forward to chatting again and having her over and, you know, enjoying this. So. Yes. Yeah, that's fabulous. I want to mention, too. Maybe sometime we can, I can invite everyone over to my house. Um, once I get my singing bowl, <laughs> I can invite everybody up, uh, to have a, have a bit of a repast at, uh, at my house on Aaron Era. That would be Sounds awesome. Good. Thank you. <laughs> yep. Thank you for the invitation. Hey, Frank. <laughs> well, thank you for this uh, opportunity once again, Linda and Andrea. Um, I want to share with you... Uh, I've met some extraordinary individuals, and uh, when I moved back from California to New Jersey, uh, I met uh, Commander Graham Bethune in 1990 and uh, was able to connect with him, and he shared some incredible things with me during the course of his uh, the, of our interaction. And um, he always would tell me, he said, Frank, he said, the Navy is a real driving force behind contact with our, our star friends, and the Navy was being used as a straw dog to take attention away from the Navy, making them think that uh, the Navy was the one that was enforcing the uh, interaction with uh, the visitors, but he said it was really the Navy. And he told me that he had flown uh, Admiral Byrd twice on missions, and one of the missions were revealed to me uh, after Graham passed by Colonel Don Ware. And I think I shared that with your, your audience uh, before. If not, I could share it again. But he had also gone through uh, flight school with members of the uh, uh, Mercury astronauts. He knew personally uh, Gordon Cooper. He knew uh, John Glenn. He knew uh, Alan Shepard. He knew um, uh, Edgar Mitchell and many others. And uh, these people were very open and honest and direct with him. And they shared their own experiences regarding seeing the saucers when they were in space. So... Um, 
Graham also told me that he participated in two crash retrievals where he flew uh, five-star General uh, George Marshall to uh, one in, in Iceland. And he said on board the plane was all uh, Navy personnel, American scientists and British scientists. And then he flew them to another crash retrieval that occurred in Utah. And uh, the one in Utah also had just new American and English scientists. Uh, one was uh, retrieved in diameter, and it was charcoal gray in color. And he said it had a slight indentation in it when it had uh, apparently hit a boulder. And he said that it was so light that four Navy personnel could lift up the craft. But um, he was uh, the first person that I'd ever met who was written up in uh, Project Blue Book. And he had an experience in 1951. He was flying back from Iceland to the United States. And, and um, he and saw a craft 300 feet in diameter. And we have a clip of him speaking about this event. It's a short clip. And I want to share with your audience, Linda. Okay. Thank you. We will share it. Great. From uh, Keplavik, Iceland to Argentia, Newfoundland, at about 10,000 feet, this was at night. I happened to observe a little bit off of the bow, about 10 or 15 degrees on the water below the horizon, a yellow glow. It appeared as though we were approaching a city at night. Since we were over 300 miles from Argentia, I knew that it couldn't be a city, that maybe possibly there were some ships lighting up, and that uh, there were ships in the area that we didn't know about. I asked the, the navigator, and he said, no, there were no ship flights, and that we were not close to the land. So I observed it for a while, called it to the attention of Lieutenant Kingdon, who was sitting in the co-pilot seat. He observed it for a while. As we got close, within about 30 or 35 miles, the lights seemed to have a pattern. They were elongated, but it was not a circular type pattern, possibly the length of a couple of ships or two aircraft carriers and the width of two aircraft carriers. After observing this for a while, we got within a range of say 30 miles, the lights went out and all we saw in the water was a small halo. The small halo started its approach towards us turned to an orange, to a fiery red, to almost a purplish red. And it, at about four or 500 feet below us, it stopped its, mo its movement. I had already disengaged the autopilot in order to try to go under this craft because it looked like we were on for the lesion course. And at that time, I noticed that it was not sitting level. The craft was sitting at an angle, about 45 degrees off the bow, and it was staying with us. So it continued to move with us for a few seconds. And of course, behind me, the additional crew was standing and they, they scattered all over the cockpit. A couple were injured. Then it started its movement away from us. And at that time I could tell it was an intelligent craft of some kind guided. It came up to take a look at us and then it started its movement away from us. At that time, some other crew members came up and it looked at what we were observing. I put the autopilot back on, set my course and walked back aft and Dr. Moser was sitting back there and he was a commander in the Navy at the time. And I asked him, I said, doc, did you see what we saw? He says, yes. He says it was a flying saucer. I didn't look at it because I don't believe in such things. So at that time I rushed back to the cockpit and I told Lieutenant Jones who had taken my seat, I says, Mal, it says, whatever you do, don't tell anybody that we saw a flying saucer because they would probably lock us up when we land. So he said, well, it's too late that I had called Gander Control to see if they had anything on the radar. So at that time, we knew that uh, they knew that we had sighted something. Thank you, Linda. You're welcome. Um, I just realized something I don't think I shared screen. Well, welcome Maybe. No. everyone. Did I? To this no, he didn't want to say anything. Uh, <laughs> virtual did I not show screen? Oh, yes, I did. 
Okay, good. I did share screen. <laughs> I was worried. I did. <laughs> okay, that's great. Okay. <laughs> If, okay. if you want to bring up the uh, first photograph of uh, Graham, uh, where he's in a cockpit, uh, once again, the incident that he described uh, occurred in 1951. The craft was 300 feet in diameter. And uh, when he landed at Gander Air Force Base, uh, he said that uh, they were all debriefed. And uh, if you have Graham's photograph up, it's not showing on my end. Okay, let me make sure that I'm sharing screen. Yep. Okay, now, now it's up. Yeah, that's great. Can you make it a little larger? Yes. One second. Normally I can. Why is it not? There, go. there it is. It's starting to move. There it is. That's excellent. Uh, anyway, um, when they landed, they were all debriefed and they were told never to talk about the incident. And uh, Graham pursued uh, getting a copy of the report through the Freedom of Information Act. And he worked on that for like 25 years because he wanted to go public with this disclosure. And uh, as I mentioned, it was written up on Blue Book. It was one of the first UFO sightings that was written up on Blue Book. And he finally got a copy of the actual event uh, 25 years later, and they had changed the date of the actual incident to make it hard for people to find it. But he actually found it. He, wasn't gonna, uh, he was not going to give up until he got a copy of the report. And Graham would tell me, he said, Frank, he said, you should always take a look at the secret diaries of Admiral Byrd. He said, remember, he said that he had gone through a polar opening at the North Pole and also wanted to South Pole. And I said, yes. And he said he had written a diary that had been sequestered by the government and it had been leaked out many, many years uh, uh, later. And in it, he talked about seeing an, an inner society, a civilization that existed within these openings, the polar openings. And he said that um, there were trees and flowers. There was no snow. The temperature was like 72 degrees uh, year round. And he met with the, the ruler of the inner earth. And he said they were very welcoming. And they said that at one time they had lived on the surface and they had uh, begun living in the inner part of the earth. And he said that they were uh, very gregacious, very kind, very considerate people. And they were looking forward to revealing themselves to the earth. Uh, the surface world at some point in the future. And he also said in his secret diaries that they had the ability of going from pole to pole in instance, in just like seconds, that the technology that they had in the inner earth. And he said that uh, Admiral Byrd was trying to reveal something to the world that they really sequestered. And, uh, but he always would tell me, he said, he said there was something about Admiral Byrd, but I found out years later that he had flown him on two secret missions. And uh, I'll go into a little bit uh, more of that a little bit later on. Let's go into the next photograph. Okay, this is Graham when he joined uh, the Navy. And uh, as I mentioned to you, he had trained with uh, the Mercury astronauts at Pensacola, Florida. He had gone through flight school there. He knew Gordon Cooper, he knew John Glenn, he knew uh, Alan Shepard, he knew uh, Edgar Mitchell and many others. And they revealed a lot of information to him regarding their own uh, experiences seeing craft. Now, Graham's classification was VIP flagship status top secret. Flagship status meant that he was assigned to a carrier group and he would fly admirals to different uh, locations for different uh, uh, reasons. And um, his clearance was among the highest that somebody could achieve. Uh, he had also flown uh, the Secretary of the Navy many times, the Secretary of Defense, he had flown many times, but the um, two most remarkable ones were flying uh, George Marshall on two crash retrievals and flying uh, uh, Admiral Byrd twice. And I'll talk more about the Admiral Byrd incident later on. You can go on to the next photograph. This is a representation of the craft that uh, Graham had seen on the horizon as he was flying back from uh, Iceland to Newfoundland and back to the States. And if you could see on the right-hand side, if you could point it out, that's the uh, aircraft that, that Graham was in. And he saw this in the distance. He thought it was a city on the horizon. And he said, when it got closer, the lights went out and there was just a halo on the water. And then this halo came out of the water and came up close to the craft. And he said, it was right outside the cockpit and it was 300 feet in diameter. And it basically paced him for about maybe 10 minutes or so. And, but there was nothing negative about it. He said they just it blew their mind that something 
that big existed out there that they didn't know anything about. And yet it was intelligently controlled. And uh, he felt that there were beings in it that were uh, just monitoring uh, his plane. And this was in 1951. It was written up in Blue Book. You can go into the next photo. Again, this is a picture of Graham. And uh, he basically did this presentation after he got a copy of the report that uh, he had asked for under the Freedom of Information Act. And that was a photograph of him in 1951 on the right side when he finally uh, got a copy of the debriefing that they had all seen this saucer that was 300 feet in diameter. And there were some of his crew members that were still alive and they validated it. But Graham was the most public of all those. And he was also one of the witnesses who came forward when Stephen Greer did the disclosure project. Uh, Graham was one of the first Navy uh, or the first government uh, military personnel to come forward to talk about his experiences and that they were real, intelligent, uh, intelligently uh, directed craft. You go on to the next one, Linda. And this is a picture of him at the uh, uh, the Washington, D.C. Uh, disclosure project that Stephen Greer had put together. And he publicly spoke for the first time about his UFO experiences as a uh, a Navy pilot, as a commander, and as uh, having top secret clearance, and talked about some of the experiences he had while he was in the Navy. And it was really remarkable. He was never afraid of anything except uh, going public and being uh, telling the public the truth about what was really going on. He said it was uh, meant to be that we all know that we're part of a cosmic family. And he had also told me that astronaut Gordon Cooper had informed him that he had done, Gordon Cooper had had a closed session of the United Nations about the star visitors. And uh, in Gordon Cooper's book, he talks about that experience, telling the, the individuals at the United Nations that were part of a cosmic family, that they're, they're visiting here. They've been visiting here for a long period of time. And he also talked about uh, having seen Kraft himself uh, during the uh, Second World War and after the war, and uh, also a landing at uh, Vandenberg Air Force Base where a being came out and looked like us. We had blonde hair and uh, apparently blue eyes. It was wearing a one-piece suit, and there was uh, photos taken of this uh, visitor and his craft, both uh, black and white and color uh, footage, as well as uh, motion picture footage. And when uh, Gordon Cooper uh, contacted the Pentagon and told him that this craft had landed and there was an ongoing visit, he was told to take as many photos as possible and then sent two officers with briefcases that were handcuffed to their wrists to fly back with the negatives and the photographs of the being in the saucer that had landed. And uh, Gordon Cooper had shared this with Graham and Graham shared this with us. It's really remarkable what... Uh, the astronauts had seen in some of their own experiences, and yet they were basically kept quiet. They were told not to, to reveal these things. You can go on to the next photo. Okay. Uh, when Graham got out of the Navy, uh, he uh, got into a business where he would transcribe microfilm into uh, uh, an analog uh, type of format. And uh, they worked with a lot of government facilities in, in being able to transcribe messages and uh, put them into uh, uh, more of a, a permanent type of uh, storage. So there was an individual who worked with Graham who was a photographer, and uh, they had to uh, go down to uh, Nashville, Tennessee, and this was in 1989. And this fella who was working with Graham was driving outside of Nashville it was about 35 miles outside of Nashville, and I believe it was in August. And he saw something uh, above the tree line. There's a huge forest outside of Nashville. Uh, I forget the uh, route that it's along, but he had uh, cameras with him, and he stopped his station wagon and went out and began taking photographs of this craft. And this craft was uh, probably about maybe 300 feet in diameter and uh he took a series of groups that graham pub privately published and he had been told that these were a group of pladians from the star alcyon that wanted to have their photographs taken of their craft of crystal clear photographs that were not blurry and uh 
Graham put this together and he made it available for people. Apparently, it did not get too much recognition, but he showed me the original photographs of them. And this is the cover of the little booklet that he had put together. If you're lucky enough to find a copy of this, uh, it's a little gift. It's a little treasure. You can go on to the next photo. Again, this is one of a series of photographs. It's like the ship was posing for Graham's friend to take these incredible photographs. And he had a, a very, very good lens system on his camera so he could zoom into the craft. And the craft goes through a series of colors and emits uh, lights and a uh, smoke effect that were all captured in these series of photographs. You can go on to the next one. This one is great. Isn't that unbelievable? Yeah. Uh, when I saw this, I said to, uh, to Graham, I said, look at this. I said, you could see that the craft has the ability of sending out light at different frequency beams so that some are longer than others. And he, and, they, and he said, yes, it's truly remarkable because we don't have that technology to this day to be able to control the measure of light that emanates from from this uh, structure or, or an object. Go ahead, you can go on to the next one. This is really remarkable too. Look at the colors underneath that uh, ball that's mm -hmm. under the, uh, the bottom of the craft. Yeah. Can you zoom in on that a little bit more? Yeah, it's kind of blurry with the, you know, it's, it's just pixelated, but yeah, you can see it. But it's really beautiful. His, his uh, friend, his associate that took all these photos said it kept changing colors and doing extraordinary things. And it was completely soundless. There was nobody else around. It was all done above the, uh, probably maybe 150 feet off the ground above the uh, surface of the, uh, the uh, forest, the trees that were uh, along the road that he was traveling. And it was maybe a close to midnight. So there was nobody else on the road and it was a perfect background. The black sky is a perfect background for right. these photos. Is this, is this like a, this is what you're referring to as the ball right here? Yes. Yes. It looks like a ball type so, uh, object underneath the craft and you could see there's ionization going on uh, as it's going through different uh, power formations there and, and creating this lighting effect. Go on to the next one. And again, you can see the beams of light coming down at different different lengths. Isn't that remarkable? Oh, this one's really clear. Yeah, you can definitely see the ball there. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine seeing that? I mean, you, you'd be completely mesmerized by it. And they wanted these photographs to be taken crystal clear so people could see that the crafts do exist and uh, they're here and not to be apprehensive about it. This looks like a beam coming out of this. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. And see that, that ball underneath, but it's not as lit up as it was in the previous one. Right. Right. Yes. That's Can you zoom in a little bit more on that, uh, the ball underneath the, uh, the bottom of it? Yeah. Right there. Yep. Okay. Yep. You That's really remarkable. This. Yes. That's crazy. I love it. <laughs> this this photograph is remarkable as well. Mm -hmm. I mean, the color rendition is so sharp and so uh, it, it's just like a, a it's a feast for the eyes, isn't it? Yeah, you can see it. It almost looks like a ride, you know, like a yes, yes. In a, in like yeah, a, would you like like some ride? <laughs> yes, I love the light, the red lights with the aqua lights next to them. Yes, can you make it a little larger? So they yeah. could see the uh, aqua lights yeah. in the inner space. I mean, that's really, really they're beautiful. Kind of Whitish, and then they turn kind of aqua. So they probably changed colors, right? Maybe. Yes, he said it kept changing from like moment to moment, and he was trying to capture as many photographs as he could. And I, I think this whole thing occurred over maybe about a ten-minute period. Wow. And it, it reminds me of a bird, you know, a tropical, you know, one yeah. of those like, birds of paradise type. Yes. It's, it's resplendent. When you see it, you just, oh, look at that. It's, you know. mm -hmm. But can you imagine all that was all soundless? Oh, no yeah. noise at all. No noise at all. It's too bad he couldn't get video. Yeah, he, he didn't have any video cameras uh, at all. This is really remarkable, too. Look at all that that uh, orange reddish light. It's, it's uh, reflecting down to the ground. Isn't that remarkable? All those beams coming out. That's beautiful. Yeah. It reminds I mean, me of... Kind Go of ahead. like a giant squid, you know, like that one I was showing you where they have the legs that come down the tentacles, you know. It's very How similar. many beams do you think that is in there, Linda? How many beams do you think it is? 
four, five, six. There must maybe there's twelve altogether. Because it looks like inside. it looks like there's a beam coming out of each one of those portals, doesn't it? Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Looks like Andrea, have you ever seen anything like this, Andrea? No. I mean, I've never seen them put them on display like that. No, I was. <laughs> I mean, it's mind blowing, isn't it? I think yeah. it's time we did, though. I mean, yes, I think it's time we did. But I think okay. that's the point. I mean, if you flew something like this over a bunch of people, they're going to be like unbelievable. They're going to love it. Yeah. yeah. Why wouldn't you? I mean, right. you did I mean, it tonight. The whole idea that you're going to show something like this, everybody's going to run screaming. No. Have they ever? Yeah. No. Everybody's yeah. like, wow, this is awesome. I want to see more. <laughs> it's like, right. yeah. I mean, they did ever. this in 1989. Yeah. And, yeah. and you can imagine what they could do today, the kind of display that they could put on for us right. today. People would, right. people would love it. They absolutely go. That would, that would just change the whole. I like this one. This is really nice. Isn't, it? isn't that unbelievable? Isn't that something? And see, they they quieted all the other lights, all the blue lights, and they right. just yeah. have. I like the red ones. Yes. Yeah. Right. And all the other beams that were coming out of the the orange beams that were coming out of here are yes. now no longer doing. That's it just cool. shows, Linda and Andrea, they can make the craft look any any way they want. Oh yeah, well they can they can they can make it look at any way they want. Yeah. Mm. That's beautiful. Yeah. Oh, look at that. <laughs> it's it's something. Crown. <laughs> it almost looks like a crown. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Absolutely right. I wanted to say to you, um, I think it was two years ago, a father and son in Ohio were uh, traveling and it was towards the end of the day and it was just getting dusk. And uh, let me know if you've heard of this uh, when I when I describe it a little bit more. They saw something that was just crossing the sky very slowly and it was a huge craft but it was in the shape of a, of a butterfly and the craft underneath of it had all these portals and there were people looking out of the portals and uh another woman that i know who lives uh in the midwest she's also a contactee she told me she was able to tune into the craft and she said they're here for part of the disclosure and she said you're going to see so many different shaped craft but this one looked like a butterfly. I'm going to have to send you a clip of it. It's absolutely remarkable. Oh, Had you okay. seen it before, Andrea? Had you seen it? Oh, I've never seen a butterfly, no. Oh, my God. It's a beautiful shaped craft. And they, they filmed it for probably maybe 30 seconds, maybe 45 seconds. Oh, that's gorgeous. I mean, that's... And they, they, wanted, they wanted to be photographed. They wanted it to be captured so that people could see there's other different types of craft here, that their visitors are here to help us to uh, be accepted back into our cosmic family. Yeah. Yes, that's beautiful. I'm, yeah. so, I'm happy to be able to share this story because Graham is no longer with us. He passed in October of uh, uh, October 30th of 2006, but he mm -hmm. left a lot of wonderful stories and memories with us. And uh, I think I shared the story with Andrea. I, I didn't share this with Linda. Uh, if you can go back to that photograph of him, is that the last photo? But on the uh, set, Linda? Yes, that's the last okay. one. Okay. Yeah, if you can go back to the picture of Graham. Uh, I told him about, yeah, that's fine. If you could make that full screen. Yeah. Uh, I told him about Valiant Thor and about uh, Dr. Frank Strange's and that uh, Valiant Thor had been here for a three-year period. And uh, since Graham was a pilot, uh, I told him that I had been at an event where Dr. Strange's showed a photograph of Valiant Thor's craft. And he also showed a blueprint of it. And Graham said, Frank, is that available? I said, Graham, I really don't know. I said, what you might want to do is write to Dr. Strange's and let him know that uh, I had mentioned it to you that there's a blueprint of Valiant Thor's uh, ship Victor One. It's 300 feet in diameter. And he wrote to Dr. Strange's and Dr. Strange's uh, said to, to Graham, let me check with Val and ask him if it would be all right to have that provided to you. So Dr. Strangers got back to Graham and said, Val said, yes, you could have a copy of the blueprint of my ship, Victor One, but he didn't want Dr. Strangers to send it through the mail. He said, Val said that you can have a copy of it, but you have to come here and I have to give you the copy of it personally to know that it's in your possession and no one else uh, took it out of the mail or anything like that. So Graham, having been uh, a retired uh, Navy pilot, he could fly anywhere that he wanted free of charge in the world. 
So he flew out to, to Van Nuys, California, met with Dr. Strangers. Dr. Strangers gave him uh, a package that was sealed by Val. And he said, this is for you. He said, I've not opened it. He said, Val gave it to me the way that it was. And when he opened it up, it was the blueprint. So he flew back to New Jersey. He contacted me when he flew back and he said, Frank, let's get together for lunch. He said, I want you to see what Val had given him. And and he asked me, he wanted to ask me if it was the same one that we, that I had seen that Dr. Strangers had uh, shared. So we got together for lunch and we asked for a quiet table so nobody could interrupt us. And he opened up his briefcase and he took out this blueprint and he unfolded it on the table. It covered the table. And it was it. And I said, Graham, I said, you have a real gift from Valiant Thor. This is a blueprint of his ship. He was so happy about it. He, oh, my God. He was like a kid in a candy shop. It was so, yeah. so wonderful. And, and I'm saying a valve ship is beautiful. It showed, you know, the control room. It showed the cabin quarters. It showed all aspects of the ship. It's a huge ship, 300 feet in diameter. It's a huge ship. Yeah. Amazing. So that was one of Graham's uh, prized possessions to have a copy of uh, Valiant Thor's uh, starship, his, his command ship. Did you and, what, what color it was inside? This was just a blueprint. I, I don't know what the color of the craft was inside. I know from the outside, it's it's very reminiscent of like, um, uh, what is that stone called? Uh, turquoise. It's very like turquoise colored. Oh, okay. Cool. Turquoise. Okay. Like what was the shape of it like? Was it? It was round. round. It was round. Yes. Was, was it round. similar to this? Uh, similar, but uh, different coloring. I think it's flat, it's flatter too. It doesn't have all that, you know. Yes. No yeah. ball, ball. The, the one the Graham had the. Uh, oh, you're talking about the ones from Nashville? No, Val ship is is. Uh, uh, Almost more like the uh, Palladian ship that was on the cover of Billy Meyer's uh, book. Yeah. Okay. It almost looks like that. But there are lights underneath of it, very similar to that ball that's in that one photograph from uh, Tennessee. And But it's got lights around the rim, and the body of the ship's more like a turquoise color. Right. Because remember I sent you that photograph taken of uh, Val's ship? He allowed it to be taken over Lake Mead at nighttime. Yes. So it's it's flatter. That, like it was yes. flatter. More yeah, it was flatter. Flat. Yeah. But I'm that's big enough inside to go from here to Venus. <laughs> oh, you, don't, you don't need much. It only takes a few. Yeah. That's right. Val ship only had was it two or three three stories? I think it had at least two stories to it. Yeah, two at least. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. At least two stories. But I'm telling you, the blueprint of it was beautiful and it was so detailed. There was so much detail in the blueprint of his ship. And you know, for Val to give it to to Dr. Uh, Frank Strangers and for him to give it to uh, Graham it was a beautiful gift, a beautiful gift, and and a very kind and loving gift. Oh, he's, right. he's that's that's who he is. That's the kind of guy he is. That's the kind of guy he is. Wonder, sure. It is still exists. That's, it. that's like that, that, that blueprint still exists somewhere. I want to tell you that when Graham passed away, he he told me his house was filled with uh, things that he had collected during his military career and uh, things that had been given to him by Admiral Forney, who was uh, the person that uh, Graham reported to. Admiral Forney uh, was in military and naval intelligence, and he kept wanting Graham to come back into the Navy again because Graham was such a, a tremendous officer and he had a lot of integrity. And... Uh, Admiral Forney would give him things and Graham would take them home and he would show them to me, but he never wanted anybody to come to his house. He said, uh, my house is not really a home that you could come to visit. He said, it's more like a museum that when he passed, um, I went to the uh, services, the services were held, uh, uh, out towards uh, Tom's river and, uh, the funeral home where, uh, Graham had his services. They had his log book when he went to Pensacola, Florida to fl through flight school. And you could see the names of the other astronauts who had gone through flight school with Graham. And his his wife was sitting in the front row and we were sharing, sharing stories about what Graham had shared with us regarding his interest in uh, the visitors. And she was blown away. His wife didn't know all the things that Graham was involved in. Wow. And I noticed, I noticed in the back of the room, there were four fellas 
that had military style haircuts. They were all wearing uh, dark uh, raincoats. And you could tell that they were military guys because they had highly shined uh, shoes. And they waited till everybody paid their respects to Graham's widow and that the eulogy was given. And then they each come up one by one to give uh, the regards to Graham's wife. And they uh, accompanied uh, the service to the uh, cemetery. And he had a full military salute, 21 gun salute. It was really beautiful. It was full naval honors because he was, a, you know, he was a really well recognized naval officer. And they knew the extent of what he was involved in and some of the secret missions. And uh, I'll tell you the story about uh, after Graham had passed and uh, I was in contact with Colonel Ware and Colonel Ware was the one that gave me a copy of the uh, the report, uh, the Rockwell Integrated Space Chart. And uh, we started talking about Graham and he said, Frank, did Graham ever tell you about the trip that he took Admiral Byrd on? And I said, no. I said, I knew he had flown Admiral Byrd, and he talked about his diary and about uh, that there were a lot of secret things that uh, Admiral Byrd was involved in. Uh, if you can go back to that first photograph that shows Graham in the uh, cockpit, Colonel Ware told me that at the end of the war, Graham told him in August of 1945 that a mission was put together to go to Antarctica because there were German scientists that had escaped Germany and they had had saucer technology and they had established a facility in Antarctica. And uh, Graham was to fly Admiral Byrd and other Navy personnel and British and American scientists to this meeting with German scientists to ask them uh, to share the technology with them. Well, the meeting went very, very bad. Admiral Byrd was told by the German scientists that there was no sharing of information. They were going to keep it to themselves. So uh, Admiral Byrd had uh, wired back to the Pentagon and told them that the meeting went very badly. And the Pentagon told Admiral Byrd to come directly back to the Pentagon for a full debriefing. And Graham flew him back to the Pentagon. And apparently what happened was they figured that since the Germans were not going to cooperate with uh, the Navy and with uh, our scientists, they were going to send a task force down there to try to force the issue. And in 1947, uh, a flotilla of ships and, and uh, a lot of airplanes and uh, an aircraft carrier made their way down to Antarctica. And there was a conflict. It's called the uh, Operation High Jump. And the Germans sank some of the boats and knocked a lot of the planes out of the air. And I'd mentioned to you there was a Russian documentary that had footage of that Operation High Jump battle scene. And uh, they posted it on YouTube. And I got a copy of it and I showed it to uh, Bill Tompkins. And Bill said, this is authentic footage. He said the German craft that were uh, uh, in conflict with our Navy in 1947, they were 600 feet in diameter. They were huge saucers. And he said, how did the Russians get this? I said, I said, Bill, I don't know. But Bill said, the, uh, this was real footage. And I think I sent that link to you and uh, Andrea about the. Uh, yeah, no, the uh, we use that in my class. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's incredible. It's it's all it's all uh, subtitled. But these are Russian officers talking about something that happened that's been kept secret from uh, the American public. Yes. But Graham was the person who flew Admiral Byrd down there to that mission uh, to try to get them to share the technology. So when Colonel Ward told me the story, he said, Graham told him this when they were at a conference in Los Angeles. And he said he told this to him backstage. And Colonel Ward wanted me to be aware of it. And it's, believe me, it's a little known story. Do you yeah. think you could send me that link again and I'll put it in the description of this video? So yeah, can... of course, of course. Absolutely. Yeah, awesome. yeah people, would, people would love to access that for sure. Yeah, yeah. Right, sure. that would be a good reference. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, these people were involved in things of such historical value. A lot of the history books would be rewritten based upon these people's personal experiences, you know, behind the scenes. Absolutely, yes. They need to be rewritten. <laughs> they do. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> they do. But I, 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 it's an honor to be able to share this information about Graham. And we had so many wonderful uh, meetings together and luncheons where he would show me things. And 
he would uh, share things with me and uh, he became a wonderful confidant and uh, God rest his soul. He's, he's upstairs now. Yes. That's and awesome. I'm sure we'll see, again. we'll see each other again. You know, there's, there's yeah. no, there's no uh, distance between uh, friends. No, nope. right. not at all. And, and you can see him anytime you want. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Yes. That's so awesome. Andrew, if he comes through to you, let me know. Oh, I, well, yeah, that would be different. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know if he's passed away and if he's in source or if he's. <laughs> well, I, I think he's probably got his own chip upstairs now. I think he's got his own chip. Well, that's if they took his consciousness and switched him out. I don't know. You know. Yeah. But if you do come across it, give him my regards. I will. Also, well, you can do that anytime. You're all, yes. everybody quantum entangled. So anytime, just call him in yeah. and say, I mean, well, he, you know, tell him you just put this this video together for him. Yeah. Yes. Well, I'm sure he's aware of it. I'm I'm sure we're on the big screen now. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. I mean, the big the big screen's there for all of us. It's there for all of us. Everybody's up there singing "Happy Birthday" to Linda. Oh. Yeah, I'm sure. Thank yes. You. <laughs> thank you. Have you heard, Linda? Have you heard any of the heaven heavenly harmony yet for your birthday? Oh yes, I've been, I've been walking in nature today, so I've I've been hearing a lot of that. Yes, it's been beautiful. Good. You deserve all of that, and please do something special to celebrate this uh, remarkable day. Oh, I will. Thank you so much. Thank thank you. And before you leave, don't go anywhere, Frank, because I wanted to say something. But um, but everyone else, um, thank you for watching. I do appreciate it, and you can find me on Patreon as well. Uh, Potentials podcast on Patreon, where you can watch all of my videos uh, ad free. And uh, also you can get some videos that have some highly classified technical information <laughs> that has not been yet released to the public. So um, I think you'll find it very interesting. So thank you for watching and liking and subscribing and feel free to put a comment on this uh, video and, and let us know what you think. Uh, we're all happy to hear from you and we like to respond to any comments that you that you leave. So thanks again and just want to say to everyone, uh, ciao for now. Thank you. Thank you.